Can I tell you one of the most exciting numbers that I think we have experienced? It's eight. Doesn't sound like a big number, does it? That's how many baptisms we had last week. Eight. And that is awesome. We had another one this morning, first service. Gabriel went all in, did the polar bear plunge because I completely forgot to put the heater on there last night. But he's like, dude, for all that Jesus went through, I can handle some cold water. That's, that's awesome. Now, in addition to that, we've got two more scheduled for next week. God is on the move in a big way, and it's been exciting to be a part of that. It was November 19th, 1995. That's when I entered into the waters of baptism myself. And I want to tell you a little thing that led me up to that. You see, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Uh, the attendance that I had uh, going to church was very minimal. And when I started attending myself when I was in uh, about 8th grade, it was still kind of spotty, though it was increasing. And what really changed is whenever my cousin moved back to the area, and so 15 miles away from my family, which would be my stepdad, who I, I really wanted to get away from, and two younger brothers that constantly would nag at me. And so I wanted to get away, and this was my escape. I'm going to go hang with my cousin, who was like a best friend to me. And it had absolutely nothing to do with church, at least in the beginning. And so I began to attend, and it started off with, with just youth group. And so uh, I would attend this youth group, and guess what? Every one of the leaders that we had in this youth ministry, they were volunteers. Not one of them was paid to be there. But yet they loved on me exactly where I was at, and they continued to help me to get to a better place. One of those guys, he lived in the same community that I lived in, 15 miles away, and so instead of me just happening to be at my cousin's house and making it in, he would give me a ride, and so I could start going more regularly. And guess what happens whenever you spend 15 minutes each way in a car with somebody? You kind of get to know them a little bit, they get to know you a little bit, and so this relationship began to evolve. And so then he invited me to his home where uh, we sat down and, and went through a discipleship book. I still have a copy of that book that we went through uh, in my senior year of high school. And I couldn't tell you a thing that we learned about in that book. But I can tell you the relationship meant everything. Because in November 1995, a month after I had made one of the, the dumbest decisions, not the probably dumbest, because I've made a lot of them uh, in my life and began to realize I was at a fork in the road and I needed to make a decision, am I in or am I out? I didn't go to the pastor and say, hey, I decided to give my life to Christ, I want to get Baptist. I went to Alan. Alan had no Bible college degree. Alan, matter of fact, he was running his own business, a small business, making wool dusters. Started from something he did in, in 4-H when he was in high school. But it was that relationship that really made an impact in my life. And one of the coolest things and something that we've been trying to weave into our DNA here at Connection is that it doesn't have to be about the pastor. Matter of fact, if it's about the pastor, we've missed the point. It's really about connecting other people to Jesus Christ, and you and I all get to play a, a role in that. We all get to be a part of it. And so to be able to see uh, people being, uh, being there to baptize their friends is more than, than the baptism. It's, it's showing us that you've taken the time to actually connect with them about more than just having fun, or more than just family time, or work time, or school time, but you're intentionally loving on them in the name of Jesus Christ, and you're inviting them along on a faith journey. And so why should I be the one to baptize them when you've played such a huge role in what's going on? And that's been an exciting piece to kind of see as we've been evolving. Now, we've been talking about follow me. It's a call that Jesus gave to his disciples uh, back in Matthew chapter 4. It's a call to discipleship. To be a disciple is, is to be a student, to be a follower of someone. And in the, in the Jewish or the Hebrew context, you had the rabbi, the teacher, and the disciple, the student. 
And so each student, as they were climbing their way through the scholastic environment, they would follow after a rabbi. And so it wasn't an unlikely call. It wasn't an unheard of thing. But it was a little bit different because these guys were inside of the rabbinical school and you know they, they were making straight A's and now we're called to go to the next level. These guys were the ones that flunked out. And so Jesus is calling them on a journey. Let's pause there and let's fast forward to the end of his ministry. Jesus had about three years of ministry on earth from about the age of 30 to about the age of 33. And after he is, has been crucified, he's been buried and he's resurrected again, he's appeared to a lot of other believers and he's shared this testimony. And now he's getting ready to ascend back to be with God at the end of the book of Matthew. He says these words to those who are following after him. Matthew 28, starting in verse 19. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, okay, he's passing the baton. I'm getting ready to leave and I'm giving you the job. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And then he unpacks that in a couple different ways. Number one, by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And number two, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. He's, he's kind of given his seal of approval. I'm with you. right? You don't have to do this on your own power. I'm there. I've got you. And so we talked about last week three things that are required of discipleship as we're making disciples of other people. Number one is it requires movement. We have to go. It doesn't say, therefore, invite. Right? The church is without walls and we go to where the people are. Discipleship requires movement. Number two, it requires surrender. Right? Because we are being baptized. That means we give up the ability to be right, the ability to be in control, and we allow Jesus to be in control of our life. And so when we're baptized, we die to our own will, our own desires, our sin. And in that, we raise up to walk in newness of life, but also in submission to Christ. We go and we die. And then we make disciples by teaching. Right? So it's, it's not about us. Teaching is a very selfless thing. A lot of times when we think about church as being this thing where we go to and we attend and we, we listen or we raise our hands and then we go back to work or we go to school or we go home, <clears throat> we miss the mark if we don't take something with us. Because we can be very self-absorbed in a learning environment. But in a teaching environment... You're giving it away. And so we've learned that in order to make disciples, what Jesus wants us to do is to go, to surrender, and to teach, right? To, to give it away. And all of that kind of comes back to Matthew chapter 4. Because when he's calling his first disciples, it was on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. They'd just been out fishing that night. They've caught nothing and he, he encourages them to cast out their nets in submission. They do it even though they're like, whatever. And they go out and they catch fish. And Jesus talks because Jesus has this way of talking through life. And he meets them right where they're at. And he issues in verse 19 this, this call to them. He says, number one, follow me. You see, you can't be a disciple of Jesus without following after Jesus. Jesus. This, this isn't a call. He didn't say to His disciples, hey, come on guys, let's go to the, the church. He didn't say, hey guys, come on, let's go to a prayer meeting. Those are both good, right? But that's not the call. The call is to follow after, to be in the presence of Jesus. And in the presence of Jesus, everything that He says and does, all that He is, like he can't hide anything because they're doing life together. All of that's going to rub off on them. And so as they go through this three years of Jesus' ministry, he's just bleeding into them. All that he is. And in that experience, they can't help but be made into the image of Christ. 
And so he says, follow me. It's a decision that you and I each have to, at some point, decide, am I in or am I out? Right? This isn't an experiential thing, this is a choice thing. Do I want to follow Jesus? Do I believe that Jesus is indeed the Son of God? Do I want to live my life in obedience to Him? And then, I will make you. Most of us, we understand that, that in life, we probably lack experience. We lack understanding. We lack the knowledge and ability. Guess what? These guys were fishermen. And yet their call was not to be perfect at that point in time, but to allow Jesus to work in their life. And so before you begin to make excuses, I don't know enough, I haven't experienced enough, what if somebody asks me a question I don't know, I want to give you this little bit of information. Jesus promises, pause, put that on hold. Now this is the same Jesus who descended out of heaven to take on flesh, to walk this earth, and to surrender His life as a sacrifice for you and I on a cross, only to be buried and raised again three days later to give us the promise of new life in eternity with God in heaven. That's the Jesus we're talking about. Okay, so this Jesus is calling you to follow Him, and what He tells you is, you don't have to have all the answers but I will make you. Do you understand what I'm saying here? The Jesus who loves you and died for you is in the process of equipping you to do what He wants you to do. You don't have to have the answers ahead of time. So you and I can, can take that, that bag of excuses and we can set them to the side because Jesus is going to work within us even if we're a fisherman. So who are you? And what's your excuse? Because I believe that Jesus wants to step into your life and Remove that so that He can begin to make you into what He wants you to be. And what He wants you to be is a fisher of men. And this was a call specifically to fishermen who would understand this analogy, but this is just the way that Jesus taught intentionally to the guys that He was reaching out to. Okay, and so the easy way for us, I think, to understand this is that if, if Jesus' call was for them to come in and sit on a pew, right, then, then He would be building an aquarium of fish. And so Jesus didn't say, hey, come, come be a part of my aquarium. Come be a church in a box. He didn't say, hey, come be a caretaker of an aquarium. He said, come be a fisher of men. He was calling them not to sit, but to action. Not a pew sitter, but a go getter. And so they were unleashed. You and I would be amiss if we thought that it was just the responsibility of one or two people to go fish for men and to bring them in. Right? That's not the way this thing works. You and I are called as Connection Christian Church to connect the Columbus area to Jesus Christ because Jesus' call was to go into all the world and to baptize and to teach, and this is our world. And so the only way that we're going to effectively do this is through multiplication, not addition. And so we multiply our efforts because you go into parts of the world that I don't go into. And you speak to people that I can't possibly speak with, and you connect with them in a way that I can't connect with them. And Jesus has called you and equipped you. Follow me, I will make you, and you're a fisher of men. And so how do we do this? Two things that I think we're going to talk about today that are most important in the discipleship process. And so all of this is leading us up to Easter because we've got the mission of Christ leading up to so that we're bringing more people into connection with Jesus. Two key ingredients. Number one, is intentionality. Intentionality. You know, no great business, no great school, no great church has ever existed without intentionality. And I believe that's true because you don't just happen to develop something that's really good unless you can find a way to sustain it and repeat it time and again. There has to be a system and a process in place that allows you to repeat this over and over and over again, and so that requires intentionality. Now, I'm not going to say that you can't stumble into something really good. Case in point, when I was a kid, my mom made some Texas chocolate cake, and she completely botched the recipe, and it was the most delicious pan of brownies I've ever had, and she couldn't repeat the process again. 
Sometimes we can really mess up the recipe and come up with something great. But it has to be done intentionally with a process that can be repeated so that we can soar to greatness. And if we're going to be about making disciples of all nations, then you and I have to be intentional about it. And it begins to change the way that we do things because you and I are called to do a lot of different things. But one of the cool things is we're all called to do the same thing as our primary focus. And that's to make disciples. So it looks a little bit like this. We go back to Matthew chapter 28, and, and in the Greek, it, it doesn't say, therefore go, it says, as you go. And so as you go to work, as you go to school, as you go to the community activities, as you chase your child to the different sporting events, as you go, make disciples. And so you and I can sometimes, in the busyness of life, get so caught up in so many different things that we forget our primary objective which is to make disciples. But if we can remember the primary objective, it doesn't matter what we do because we're making disciples as we go. And so you could be hanging out with your buddy, doing what appears to be much of nothing. But because of your contact and following after Jesus, you invite Him into your spiritual journey, which embarks them on their own spiritual journey. And they begin to see something different in you. They take note that you have indeed been with Jesus and things are different in your life. And they begin to see those kind of pieces. And so I want to encourage you, as you go, live with intentionality and make disciples of Jesus. Now I know what you're thinking, right? Because most of us are thinking that, like, I don't even know what that means. Right? How's this, what if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? <clears throat> Remember that bag of excuses we just set aside? Because Jesus says, follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. So the same Jesus that calls you up out of the grave and covers all of your sin has the ability to work in your life to cover all of those excuses. And you have to ask yourself in faith, do you believe that? And you may not have the answer all the time. I would almost guarantee that that's not going to happen. But there's a lot of things that you and I can do in response to that. Number one is we can say, you know what, I don't know the answer, but I can know somebody who knows the answer. Let me go check and I'll get back to you. Or, I know it's a tech-savvy world. Hey, let me Google that for you. I'll come up with an answer. Make sure you're checking your source. But you can do that. But one of the great tools for learning for you and I is to answer a question that either we or someone else we know has. And when we begin to pursue those answers, we begin to learn in the process. And Jesus is making us because we're following after. And if you're not following after Jesus, that means surrendering to yourself and walking in obedience to Him, then it's pretty hard for Him to make you anything. So we have to continue to remember to surrender. One of the ways that I think that it's important for us to remember to do this is don't do ministry alone. So many times we have options to do different things, different ministries, different tasks. And so every time that you and I are called to do a ministry, called to do something, take somebody with you. Right? You don't have to take a mature believer along with you. You can take somebody who is, who is completely new to the faith. Maybe they don't even know who this Jesus is. All they know is what they've heard other people say, and this is a bunch of hypocrisy. Right? But you take them on a journey together. And you begin to do things together. And guess what happens when you take somebody on a journey with you when you're already walking with Jesus? You make disciples. And so one of the key ingredients for us is to remember intentionality. Remember that we live our life with purpose. And when we begin to do that, we begin to see some other things take place. We actually get to know them a little bit. They get to know us a little bit. We begin to see what their talents and abilities are, where they are on their faith journey, and we can begin to use that. One key passage that we've got here that's new to us this day is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's on page 959 in the Bibles that we provide. Now here's the really crazy cool thing about this, is that you're going to turn there to page 959 if you've got the Bible that we provide. Or you're going to look it up on your own device, and I'm not going to read it. But I'm going to tell you about it. And I want to encourage you to go back and read it. Because it's much more than just the chapter. We're actually going to be talking about a letter. 
So the letter was written by this guy named Paul, who's also known as Saul. Saul was a Jewish man. He grew up in the Jewish faith. He persecuted those who claimed that Jesus really was the Son of God. And then one day, on the road going to his destination to do just that, God got a hold of his life and things began to change in a radical way. And this man who was, who was killing and persecuting Christians, sending them away to be locked up, was now going out on behalf of this Jesus to tell other people about him, and he was being persecuted. And in his ministry to other people, we find this group of, of Christians in Corinth. And Corinth, is they've got some believers, but the believers are really kind of messed up. The biggest issue that's going on in Corinth is they can't get along with each other. Okay, so you've got all of these, if we picture this today, we've got all of these denominational bodies who can't figure out how to get along. Right? And they're all claiming to follow different things. And they're all having this little bragging competition about who's the best. And in all of this, Paul is reminding them that you don't serve that denominational body. You don't serve that leader of that denominational body. You serve Jesus. And when you serve Jesus, everything comes together under that. And so you guys need to grow up and work together. And that's an important message that I think we need to hear many times over, and sometimes even within one small congregation. We serve the one Jesus. And in all of our diversity, in all the different things that we bring to the table, if we can focus on Jesus, it can all come together. And so in chapter 12, the intentionality is shown because Paul describes the church as a body made up of many parts. Now, I want you to think about this. If you were to get up and leave the room today, regardless of whether you're going to go grab some lunch or you're going to go use the restroom, you need a cup, another cup of coffee, whatever the case might be, I want you to try to attempt that without your body parts working together. It's not going to happen. right? Each one has a different part. Most of us aren't gifted enough to walk out of here on our hands. right? We have special body parts that help us to do that. Feet give us an extraordinary amount of balance. And they propel us forward. Right? We have a mind that kind of guides this process. We have a, a heart that's beating. You don't, we don't even have to think about making our heart beat and the, the blood is pumping and the oxygen that's coming in through our lungs that we're not thinking about. Breathing is pumping this oxygen that's making our muscles move and we have a nervous system. And all of these pieces, while so different, are all working together. This is what you call intelligent design. Right? This doesn't happen from a bang. It doesn't happen by happenstance. This is not a pan of Texas chocolate cake. This is God's intentional design. And I believe that when Paul is talking to the church, he's saying, yes, you are so diverse, but you each have a role to play. And the only thing that's going to make this mess beautiful is if we work together together under the head of Jesus Christ. And so you and I, if we're going to make disciples effectively, with a plan that we can repeat and sustain, it's going to happen with intentionality. And so as we do this intentional thing, it also requires ingredient number two. Relationships. Relationships. You and I can be as intentional as we want, but if we're not in context with people, it's not going to happen. Right? And we, can, we can be in relationship with people, but if we're not intentional, it's not going to happen. But when we take these two active ingredients together and we combine them, intentionality with relationship, then we end up creating more disciples of Jesus. And it's impossible to make disciples of Jesus without loving the people that Jesus loves. One of our key passages in Scripture comes from Mark chapter 12. It's actually repeated in other Gospel accounts. And it's kind of this Cliff Notes version. So if you're new to the church, I want you to hear this because this will just blow your mind. Like all of this, you're like, how am I ever going to read and understand all that? Somebody asks Jesus, so if you could summarize all of these laws into one, what would it be? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But then he, he tags on a number two and, 
And you can be like, okay, Jesus is going for extra credit. That's not exactly what we're talking about. But I believe it's something so much deeper than that because he says in the second is like it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And what I would tell you is I believe that it's impossible to do number one without number two. And so unless you're going to love the people that Jesus loves, it's pretty hard to love Jesus. You tracking with me? And the crazy thing about this, and I believe it with all my heart, is that ministry would be a whole lot easier if it didn't involve people, but ministry wouldn't be ministry if it didn't involve people. And some of you are thinking like, oh great, I've got to involve myself in relationships, and that's, that's, I've been burnt before, this is too much work, and it, it's a lot of work. It really is. People will mess you up. Right? The more messed up somebody is, the more hurt they are, the, the greater the chance that they're going to hurt you. The closer you pull them in, the greater the, the chances are that they're going to hurt you in the process. But I believe that it's completely worth it if our focus with intentionality is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. You see, if our goal is to simply be happy, if our goal is to create relationships, if our goal is to succeed, then we've got the wrong goal and that can really mess with us. But if our goal is to make disciples of Jesus, then we reach in and we love people where they are. And it's kind of a way that we would express this maybe is in what Jesus says, or what Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We say it this way, I heard another pastor use it and I've just, I've clinged to it and it's my own and so now you can just put, put it in quotes and put Mike Mosier behind it. But Jesus loves us exactly the way we are. Right, so he loves you and I in our mess. And that's a message that I think most of us, if not all of us, want to hear. That regardless of what I've done and what's been done to me, Jesus loves me just the way I am. But he loves us too much to let us stay that way. And he begins to help us to grow in our faith. But here's the question that gets so much harder. Are you willing to love people the way that Jesus loves you? Are you willing to love other people in their brokenness? Are you willing to love other people when they might hurt you? Are you willing to accept them in their mess? Are you willing to accept people who are different than you, who act differently, who think differently than you, do things differently than you, have different spiritual gifts than you? Because Jesus loves them just the way they are, and it's impossible to love God without loving the ones that God loves. So we're called into this mess of relationship. And in those relationships, when done with intentionality, God can do great things. And so we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. One body, many parts, and though all the parts are many, they form one body. Right? Those parts of the body can't accomplish anything that they're intended for if they're not in relation to one another. If they're not in relationship to one another, they are dismembered. Picture that for a moment. Your body is of little value if it's split up into its many parts. But when you can bring those parts together in relationship, they have a purpose. There's an intention behind it. And so all of those parts are many and they have different functions. There's great diversity as we look around the church of God and even as we look into the, the, the church of connection. There's so many different people who think so many different ways, who come from so many different backgrounds, church backgrounds, life backgrounds, addiction backgrounds, right? Men and women, we have Hispanics, we have uh, Chinese women, and it's, it's awesome. And who would think in Columbus, Nebraska, the heart of America, like all of this diversity exists and it's so awesome because in that God works together for the good of those who love him. But it doesn't happen if Jesus is not the head of the body. How does that happen? Matthew 4. We each follow after Jesus. We each allow Him to make us into what He wants us to be. We go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them. Right? And so that's our call. And as we engage in those relationships with other people, it, it tells us in John chapter 13 that they will know that we are Christians by our love. And so we love. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't say that they'll know that we're Christians by our self-righteousness. Right? But by our love. By the grace of meeting them exactly where they are. 
and bringing them to a closer encounter with Jesus so that he can make them. It's not our job. It's not my job as a pastor. My job as a pastor became so much easier when I realized I'm not Jesus. And we have to bring people into those relationships. And it's worth the mess. One of the ways we do that around here is we connect people on Sunday with God because that's important. So we love God and we love God's people and we love them enough that we connect them back with God. It sounds simplistic. It's pretty simplistic. Like that's, that's what we do. Let's not overcomplicate this if we don't have to. Love God, love people. Love the people to God. But then we connect this Columbus area to Jesus Christ whether it's through large group gatherings like this or we grow together through intentional relationships. We call them grow groups where we have these small groups in home where we do life together, we grow together, we build relationships, we apply, we hold each other accountable in the process and through that we understand the unconditional love of God on a deeper level and we begin to live the unconditional love of Jesus Christ on a deeper level, meet people where they are and they will know that we're Christians by our love and in that love we go out and serve them because we are a church without walls and as we go... We remember number one, make disciples. So intentional leaders plus relational environments produce more disciples. It's a reproducible process. Now you know the secret sauce. Two main ingredients, right? So what's your next step? What's your next step? I'm going to suggest three things to you. The third one isn't going to happen without the first two. The first one is, be more intentional about the way you do life. The second one is, engage people more relationally. You're not going to know where they are in their life, and you're not going to be able to help them get to the next step if you don't spend time with them. Jesus invited his disciples into a relationship. And number three, who's your one? Who's one person that God is putting on your heart that you need to love on, pray for, serve, invite, engage in that intentional relationship so that they can know more about Jesus?